Again, happy Sabbath, everyone. I pray that you're having a pleasant Sabbath day. And as I said earlier, it's hard to believe just the time that's just going by weekly basis. It's just, I don't know, maybe in my head, I just think maybe it's God's way of getting us where we need to go quicker. I don't know. Going through a lot of things and the things that we see. Again, it, it kind of sounds like we're repeating, but we see the lies and the deceptions. And oh my goodness, it's just unbelievable what's happening. And, but we continue to move forward. That's what we're told to do. Obviously, that's what happens. Time moves forward. We are to move forward in life. We've been called. And I will repeat this, what I've said a lot, because we have to remember that we were called and we chose to be on this path. The Father opened our minds to His truth through Jesus Christ. And as the days, the weeks and the months move and the weeks go by, years go by, you know, the years go by, and you think about things, and I just, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> We had an open house. We were about ready to start our school year this upcoming week and had an open house. And I'm going to have some eighth graders in my room that I taught as first graders. I'll do the math. What happened those past seven years? That's crazy. To see them grow and, and I get to see them because we only go up to eighth grade in the building that we're in. I get to see them and help them their last year at our school. And, and I know I know it's off a ways, but before you know it, June will be here again and we'll get to see him out the door towards their high school career. And you just think about things, time, the passage of time. But as we go through the days and the weeks and the months and the years, we are to grow in the knowledge of our Creator as the body of Christ. So I guess one of this message this week is feed the sheep message. Feed the sheep. We know what's going on in the world. I talked about it two weeks ago. and We've talked about Tom does a great job and the crew does a great job with news nuggets and insights. As the world continues to fall and crumble more and more, we are to hold fast and focus on our Savior. That's what we're told to do in Scripture. And we find comfort. I find comfort. I pray that you do as well in the, in the words that have been left for us to read and meditate on, to take in, no matter where you open up, when you start reading, find comfort in the truth and words of our Savior Jesus Christ and of His Father, our Father in Heaven. This instruction book is so amazing. And it's awesome. And it's just to take it in. It helps and guides us if we do that. The comfort that we can find to go through what's happening, that will happen, that we see unfolding before our eyes. So let's dive in today and take some time to remind ourselves of the task at hand. And I like to do that with Paul's perspective, the Apostle Paul, from his perspective. He wrote a lot of the letters in the New Testament, many of them. Let's refresh our mind. Let's refresh our spirit. Let us find comfort in God's truth through some of Paul's writing today. As we know the history of Paul, Paul wasn't even one of the original 12 apostles. He was a chosen vessel of Jesus Christ. And let's read that again. I know I've gone over it before in the many past several years of looking at Paul. It's in Acts 9. I'm not going to go through it all. But just as a reminder of who Paul was and who he became to be, who he came to be through the help and the guidance of Jesus Christ. I could pick up in chapter 8 where it says, well, let's do it. Let's pick up in chapter. I know it said chapter 9, but we can move our eyeballs over one chapter back. <laughs> chapter eight, Acts 
Acts chapter 8, verse 1, now Saul was consenting to his death. Whose death? We read back in chapter 7, Stephen's. Stephen's death. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. So, even if you think about it, even before he's called, and I know Saul's persecuting people and he was consenting to Stephen's death, even before Saul was called and he repented of his sins, he had a, a hand in scattering the word of God out to those who needed to hear it. I just thought, I think that's interesting. I find that interesting. Then we pick, you know, pick up his story in chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that he may, so that he found any who were out of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trem so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Oh, he was blinded. They had, to they had to take him in by the hand because he was blinded. And we know, like I said, I'm not going to read the entire, we've read it before, but we know that our Savior called Ananias to go and put his hands on Saul and to have him, and he would be baptized. Ananias was scared, and he had heard about Saul. Saul's reputation preceded him. It says in verse 13 that Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight, and at once and at once and, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food he was strengthened, then Saul spent, spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And that started Paul. I know later on it says his name was changed to Paul. And he started preaching and going from town to town setting up churches, setting up places where people gather to be the body of Christ. And he wrote a lot of letters. And if you take the time and you read through all the letters, they do intertwine with each other. He was chosen to be the messenger to the Gentiles. And also, it says, kings and the children of Israel. The other apostles were too, were sent to the tribes of Israel. And throughout the book of Acts, I mean, if you take the time and read the book of Acts, they talk about his journeys. The many different journeys that he went through. 
and what he was told to do and how he set up churches in different parts of the known world at that time. Many parts, many different parts of the known world. And Paul knew who he was. If you go to 1 Timothy, First Timothy 1 verse 12 says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Are we thankful? We're not all in the ministry. We're not. I'm not that's not what I'm getting at. But I right there says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. Have we thanked Christ? Have we thanked our Father for the knowledge they've given us? Because he counted, because he, Paul is saying, he counted me faithful. He didn't have to knock knock him off his donkey on the road to Damascus. He didn't have to. He did. He chose. He chose us in our life, in our journey. He says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all, all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So our Savior picked him also to be an example. For us to look at and to read his words and what happened to him. In verse 17, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And he's talking to Timothy. He's instructing Timothy. Timothy was supposed to be the next generation coming up after Paul. Let's turn to Philippians. I must spend a lot of the rest of the time in Philippians today. You can pick a lot of any of his letters, and they're all obviously good to read. As I said, they intertwine with each other. And his letters are words of encouragement, correction, clarification to the different churches that he was writing to and giving instruction to. We've talked about that in the past. Corinth had some issues. So he wrote letters to Corinth to help them, to guide them. He wrote to Galatia. He wrote to Colossae. He wrote to Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus. And he wrote to Philippi. And that's where we're going to start today. We'll continue today in the letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi. <clears throat> Philippians 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, with, with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all the joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's reminding them, and through this letter he's reminding us, that a good work has been started in each one of us that have been called. And that work will be complete when Christ returns. Then we'll have new jobs and new things to work on. But it's a reminder of a good work that's been started in each one of us. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. 
And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and of all discernment. Love. That our love may abound still more and more in knowledge in all discernment. Who else talked about love? We're going to keep our place here. So if you have a bookmark or something you want to keep here. Second John. Second John only has one chapter. Second John verses three through six. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote, wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So Paul, the message is the same. doesn't matter if John writes it, Paul writes it, Peter writes it. Whoever, James writes it. That your love may abound, back in Philippians 1, that your love may abound... And John just defined what that love was. Was listening, making sure you're following Christ, His commandments, His word. That you may approve the things that are excellent. This is verse 10, Philippians 1. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ the glory and praise of God. Although he doesn't list them here, in the letter to Galatia, to the Galatians, he talks about the fruits. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. As I said, his letters can intertwine and they back each other up. Along with the other apostles that their letters are contained here before us. Galatians 5 verse 22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Oh, okay. First one is love. Joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So that's what he's talking about. Being filled, back to Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I, have appoint, that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that scripture there reminds me, I came across something, I don't know if it was this week or two weeks ago. It was a website I came across. And, and it, of course, the world is deceived. And it, I had nothing to do with the website. I was just reading it. And 
they were saying, well, the scripture came up. And they said, well, to die is gain. Isn't that mean heaven? No, it doesn't mean heaven. It does mean eternal life. To die in Christ is to gain that eternal life. To be sealed for that day when Christ returns and the first resurrection happens. So we live Christ. We have Christ in us. We live for Christ. And then if we do die before his return, that is for our gain. If we've been faithful. But if I live on, on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having desired to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And yes, it will be. If we, when we die, we're in the grave, but we won't know it. We won't know it until the next moment in time, the resurrection happens. And then we will be with Christ. And that would be, I mean, many of the brothers, brothers and sisters that have passed, they don't have to go through what we see right now. That's just a side note. But we can, we can go through it with Christ. Paul talks about that. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's talking about himself and what he can do and how he can be helpful and live for Christ. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. That's what we have to strive. We see what's happening. That's what Christ told us to watch and pray. Each day... The world is getting terrified, more terrifying, each day. We can't deny that. We see it. I said a couple weeks ago that in my personal opinion, these things that are happening, I've, I've never seen before in my life, never heard about in history. And that's just not the wars and rumors of wars or the pestilence. It's the other things, the little things. The agendas that are going on. The lying and the deceit. More and more. And now they're just open in front of you with it. And it can be terrifying. It can be, wor it can be worrisome. It can be. But he says, and not in any way terrified by your adversary. Who's our main adversary? Well, our enemy who deceives the world. Which is to them a pr proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. So Paul was the example going through things. Another letter that he wrote, so keep your place, there's Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Because he just said this in Philippians 1. Ephesians 4. Just to back up. It's the same message to everybody. Doesn't matter again. If he, Ephesus, Philippi, Corinth. Put today's, put today's cities in. Wherever you may be. Ephesians 4 verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. In you all. That's what he's saying. Go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16, verse 13, says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Well, he just, we just said, you know, we just read in Philippians about, don't be terrified. Watch, that's what we're going to do. Our Savior said it. He must have taught Paul that because Paul wasn't there when he said it at that time. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. And in verse 14, let all that you do be done with love. And again, we just, we earlier we let John define what that love is. Let's go to Jude. Another apostle. Another disciple. Jude. Let's go to Jude. Only one chapter in Jude. Verse 3. says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So even Jude here is saying, you know, I contend with the faith, what you know. He's exhorting. This letter went out. As we continue on this journey, as we see again the things happening around us, conduct to be worthy. Check ourselves. Always keeping our eyes on what we need to do and see to reflect God and His ways. To reflect God in His ways. I know we do a lot of that. The, you know, we talk a lot about that in season with the spring holy days and the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. But it's a daily battle, a constant battle. Right now, look in the world. What's happening in the world? We're on the edge of World War III. What could happen soon? When? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. With Israel in the Middle East. This is not the spring holy day season. Is it? I mean, it is the time around the time of the ninth of Av. It is. It's not that has passed us, the actual ninth of Av, but it's that time. And we're entering here shortly in you know, about two, well, a month and a half will be trumpets, the fall holy day season. And we know what happened on the last great day last year. Watch. Be ready. Have our stuff in order. Be prepared. Is our conduct worthy? Are we doing our best to reflect what God is teaching us through Jesus Christ? And the inspired words of people like Paul and John and Peter and Matthew and Luke and all this. And even in the Old Testament, the prophets that wrote down things for us. A big part of this, he didn't write it. Actually, John was given this vision. was the vision that we see in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2 and 3 are messages. Just like Paul did, John was given a vision to write down. And there are messages to several churches. Not church eras. I know there's going to be some out there that just hear me say that and disagree. This is not about church eras. These were messages to different churches to help them, to guide them, to tell them what they could do better if they had to do something better. 
just like Paul's letters were to different churches to correct them. And we see some of the same churches pop up in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just the connection piece. This is what God did through Christ. And Christ inspired Paul to write letters. This vision of, that was given to John, write this down to help the churches of the day. And that's made it to us, because now we are the churches of the day. Wherever we may be, wherever we may meet. Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things, these things says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works what it says in all of them if you go through so I know your works Christ sees us Christ hears us he knows our works your labor your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary You see some of that in Paul's writings where he compliments and he said, you're doing this. We read that in Philippians. I'm sure if we went to his letter to, Ephes to the church in Ephesus, there's some good things that Paul wrote. We see in verse 4, though, our Savior told John to write down, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. But we just said John defined that. Were they losing their focus on Christ? Were they losing their focus on keeping the commandments? We saw John define that. We read John define that. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Then there's a message to Smyrna, then to Pergamos, then to Thyatira. Chapter 3, Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I think there's many misconceptions. I guess this might be a side note here to this message. There's many misconceptions of what the message is to Laodicea. And again, it's not church errors. I want to read this one to Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot, excuse me, neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. There's some confusion about that. Many people think, oh, if you're hot, you're hot for this. You're going, you're, you're going for it, the spirit. I'm hot, I'm going, I, I'm on fire. And if you're cold, you're like, oh, cold, you're not doing much. But there's a third word in there, lukewarm. And he says, the luke, if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Well, how can that be? How come if, if you're cold, though, aren't you cold and you're not doing the work? You're not on fire. You're not. That's not what that means. Laodicea was a church that sat with hot springs near it and also cold water, cold lakes near it. If you, do, if you look into it and see, our Savior was actually using a physical to explain the spiritual. 
Laodicea needed that, those hot springs to come in, so they had the aqueducts for that. And they also had aqueducts for the cold water to come in. Because hot water could be used for bathing, for soothing. The cold water could be used for drinking and being refreshed. Lukewarm water is good for nothing. The key word is lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. In the middle, just bleh. Don't be bleh. Cold water had a job. Hot water had a job. Lukewarm water did not have a job. It was blah. Verse 17, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need, no, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, poor, blind, and naked. So something was blocking them from seeing what they had become. So this is a message to, to that church at that time to fix it. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So they are being blinded. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That message, like many of the messages to the churches, whether here in the vision that John had from Christ, or what Paul wrote, or the letters that Peter wrote that circulated, is, you have a job. Check yourself. Are you doing what you've been called to do? Whatever your talent is. And we could go back to the parables of the talents. I kind of, me personally, kind of think if you're lukewarm, you're like the guy that took the talent and buried it in the sand, in the ground. You didn't do nothing with it. You're blah. I don't know how else to put it. This is blah. And that's what Paul was trying to get across in his letters. A good thing. You had this to work on. Do, do the job. Do what you've been called to do. We go back to Philippians 2. Like the Philippians, we're starting with chapter 2. Philippians 2 verse 1 says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort or love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem, esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which also, which was also in Christ Jesus, be, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross, which is the tree. 
Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So again, God calls us to do a work according to him for his good pleasure. He says, do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Let's keep our place there. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians ten. <clears throat> Verse ten. He says, Nor complain as some of them also complain and were destroyed by the destroyer. Don't complain. Because he's talking about our ancestors. Go back up to verse 1. Moreover, brother, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things become our examples to the extent, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So all of this, the letters, as I said earlier, the letters, the acts that Luke wrote down of the apostles, the Old Testament writings are for us to take in as examples. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And no temptation has ever taken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Because he knows us. He's using us. Paul wrote that earlier. We read earlier, to his will, his purpose. He's going to test us. See if we're going to continue on the journey. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 3. Verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Establish our hearts. Let's back up to verse 11 there. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. 
increase and abound in that love for one another. Again, verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts. Working in us with a, for a work, for a purpose. Guiding us through. 1 Thessalonians 4, just next chapter over. Verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And he's writing to the church in Thessalonica because they must have had this issue that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So that must have been one of the issues that Thessalonica was facing. In verse 7, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. In the calling of God for us to do a work. So we can be those lights. Paul writes about it. He wasn't there, but Christ must have taught him when Christ said in Matthew 5, verse 15, Be lights unto the world. You will be lights. A city on a hill is not hidden. You don't put a basket over a, a candle, over a light. You will be lights unto the world. Let's go to Romans 1, verse 18. Romans 1. Another letter that Paul wrote and we have for us. Romans 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Huh. We see this happening today. It's been happening throughout history of the world. There's ungodliness going on around us. Unrighteousness of men going on around us. Who suppress the truth. My goodness. Watch and hear and you'll hear those lies and deceit. And anything that's against God we see growing more and more and more in this day and age. That's why we have to stay the path. Back to Philippians. Philippians 3. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't finish Philippians 2, so I apologize. Back to Philippians 2. We're going to finish Philippians 2. Verse 14 again, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. So he's telling him, I'm sending Timothy to you. I can't get to you, but I'm sending Timothy. Therefore I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because he had heard that he because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So then we reach chapter 3, 
And I didn't intend for this to happen. I'm looking at this, and I didn't think I had a whole bunch of scriptures and stuff, but looking at the time, I think I'll have to cut this short and make this a part two, which is good for you. I'm trying to think of the people in Syracuse. I'll get part two of a sir <laughs> for those online because I have been asked to speak next week. A lot of information here. So we're going to wrap up today. And then I'll, I will continue this next week. God willing. God willing, continue this next week. And I'll fill in those down and in there. And pray to God that this be an easy transition from part one to part two. The purpose is to be comforted today. And look at some of what Paul went through and did and was called to do. He's, he's another example that we look at. And we use other scriptures to back him up to show that it just wasn't it wasn't different messages to different people. It's the same message. It's the same me message of encouragement, of reflection, of correction, of clarification. But it starts with Christ, where he says, watch and pray. Watch and be ready. And the disciples took that message out. So with that, we'll close up today with that. We'll continue next week, God willing. May God be with you and God bless.